Tonight, the TV show that spent $10,000 an episode just on its music. I'm Richard. And I'm Gary. And these are our incredible stories. Hello and welcome back to all of our listeners from around the world and across the United States. We're happy to have you back with us again, friends. Oh, it's always good to see you too. Oh, no. Go ahead. Come on in. Make yourself comfortable. Yeah, sit down, relax. Oh, my gosh. Look at that. No. Hi, how you doing? It's been a while. No, it's fine. It's fine. No, we're always happy to have you over here. Oh, I see you've brought some friends with you. Come on in, guys. You're welcome, too. We always love having new visitors with us. And listen, folks, you're welcomed at our place every Friday. Oh, and our world map is uh, really lighting up. Oh, my gosh. All yes, we got Europe. We got everybody here from Australia all over the place. And Canada. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We got people here from all over the place. Uh, so uh, please make yourself comfortable. And uh, for those of you that are new, um, you know, the our usual friends will show you what to do and where to go. But uh, if you want to come back every Friday, trust me, we'll have new episodes, and we're always happy to entertain. If you like what you hear, then hit that uh, like and subscribe button and join us, uh, like I said, each and every Friday. We'll always have something interesting to share with you. No worries. All right, let's go ahead and get started with our show. <laughs> so, Gary, I, uh, you know, of course, uh, what we're talking about this evening, but I wonder how many of our listeners know what iconic television show had music that cost $10,000 or more for each episode. And clue yeah. number two was a composer by the name of Jan Hammer did the scoring for the show. Uh -huh. And he uh, also created the show's title theme, which actually rose to the top of the billboard charts in November of 1985. Was it Magnum P.I.? No, it was not Magnum P.I. Was it the A-Team? <laughs> no. Ooh. Oh, I love the A-Team. Oh. Bum, bum, bum. Junkaroo. Bum, bum. No. <gasps> I'll forgive you for that one. Well, I could go through a whole list of other shows I watched as a child in the mm -hmm. 80s, but uh, I'm thinking you're talking about Miami Vice. I am talking about Miami Vice, and uh, this uh, is an absolute iconic television series that um, was uh, produced between the years 1984 and 1989. And it yes, was yes, yes. filmed in, uh, entirely in Miami, Florida. And guess what, Gary? Huh? For four of its five years, I actually lived and worked in Miami, Florida. Get out of town! Yeah, while the folks were running around the streets, uh, ha you know, staging gunfights and this and that, I was there. I you was were there. there when they were filming Miami Vice. It's um, a TV series that was created by a fellow by the name of Anthony Yurkovich. It was produced by a fellow by the name of Michael Mann. And Michael Mann, uh, as you probably know, produced a movie called um, Manhunter. Yes. And he did that uh, while Miami Vice was filming in uh, Florida. He went back to California to do Manhunter. And uh, the series stars a fellow by the name of Don Johnson as Sonny Crockett and Philip Michael Thomas as Rico Tubbs. And they yeah. were supposed to be two uh, Metro Dade uh, police detectives who were working undercover in Miami. And uh, NBC is the network that carried Miami Vice, Gary, uh, from 1984 to 1989. And <clears throat> it's uh, known for uh, integrating contemporary pop and rock music and also for its very stylish visuals. And I think you'd have to agree oh, yeah. on the visuals. Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. Um, People Magazine back then said that Miami Vice was the first show to look really new and different since color TV was invented. <laughs> that says something. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the episodes um, often ended in an intense gun battle and uh, several criminals usually lost their lives, um, you know, in the process. And the creator of the series, um, Anthony Yurkovich, uh, said, and these are his exact words, even when I was on Hill Street Blues, I was collecting information on Miami. I thought of it as a sort of modern-day American Casablanca. 
the incredible number of refugees from Central America and Cuba, on top of all that, the drug trade. And there's a fascinating amount of service industries that revolve around the drug trade. Money laundering, bail bondsmen, attorneys who service drug smugglers. Miami had become a sort of Barbary Coast of free enterprise gone berserk. (laughs) And that is where your father lived and worked (laughs) <laughs> back in the 1980s, from 1985 to 89. Now, uh, when I was there, I was told, take a look at the Miami skyline. Oh, yeah, it looks beautiful. And then the person who was a native Miami said, native Miami and said, that skyline was built by drug money. I believe that. And he said, all of the banks in Miami, you know, had at least some if not lots of drug money. Well, it was the eighties. Yeah. And, and guess, and this is, this is, this will blow your mind. He also said that, uh, the paper money that we carried in our wallets. Yeah. A lot of it would have traces of cocaine dust on it. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, I I know. Oh, the eighties. Miami was wild and woolly. In fact, it was wild and woolly. There was, uh, one um, weekend, I recall, um, uh, there was a, a mall that I lived near called the Dadeland Mall. It was a huge mall, and I lived right near that. And um, two guys got in an argument over a parking space, and one of them pulled a gun and shot the other guy over a parking space. That happens now. Yeah, but <laughs> I tell you what, it was uh, <laughs> it was pretty horrific back then. I bet it was. Yeah. So... Um, that, that was Miami. It was a Casablanca. It was a Barbary Coast, but it was an exciting place to live. I enjoyed uh, my time when I lived and worked in Miami. Oh, I bet you did. Mm-hmm. And um, we talked about the music for the show, uh, how it cost about 10000 or more per episode to do. Uh, but this was an uh, era, Gary, when uh, the new wave culture was emerging. I don't know if you're familiar with the new wave era. But it was emerging in the 1980s. And one of the directors of the show, Bobby Roth, he he said that there are certain colors you're not allowed to shoot, such as red and brown. So if you look at the different colors, especially in those early episodes, those early years, you'll see that they're um, pretty specific colors. Oh, yeah. It's very neon, very Mm -hmm. pink, very uh, fluorescent. uh, Yeah. And that even extended not just the costumes, but to the cars. Oh, yeah. No, everything, they, they couldn't everything have was, cars that yeah. were not the correct color. No, everything had a vibrancy to it. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. word to use, vibrant. And they filmed a lot uh, down at South Beach. And uh, if a building didn't have the right color, they'd repaint the building. Really? <laughs> they'd well, actually, that says a lot. They'd actually uh, repaint the exterior of the building. And I guess if you were an owner, you got paid a pretty good amount of money to have your building freshly repainted free, but oh my gosh. color that might not be attractive to you. Um, and then, uh, I don't think you know this, Gary, but uh, Miami Vice was one of the first American network television programs to be broadcast in stereophonic sound. I did not know that. But, but how, many, how many TVs in the 80s had stereophonic sound? Yeah, but Miami Vice was the first... And, of course, with the music they had, oh, I, I tell you, that, that pulsing music that they had there, that was just incredible. Jan Hammer, he was a genius with that uh, scoring and the, the title. Uh, I think uh, an artist who was definitely impacted by the show was Phil Collins because I remember one of, his, uh, one of his songs was featured on Miami Vice, and it blew up like crazy mm-hmm. after it premiered on the episode. Now, uh, if we want to talk a little bit about the cast, um, sometimes it's hard to believe, but Don Johnson and Philip Michael Thomas were not the first choices for the stars. <gasps> Do tell. Who was I, originally picked? Well, they were about second and third down the line. The, uh, first, the producers wanted, uh, um, oh, they, uh, well, they wanted Nick Nolte. Oh, I could, young Nick Nolte, I could see that. Then they wanted Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges would have been interesting. Then they wanted Mickey Rourke. Oh, Mickey Rourke in the 80s. He kind of, to me, Mickey Rourke in the 80s almost looked like um, Bruce Willis. 
They had very similar look and style to him. I bet, you know what? I think Mickey Rourke would have been pretty awesome. Oh, yeah? In that he, role. He turned it down. They offered it to him. Well, he was starting to become pretty big in movies around yeah. that time anyway, yeah. so I could see that. And it's the same thing with Nick Nolte, uh, Nick Nolte and uh, Jeff Bridges because they were all really making their name in Hollywood movie productions. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, when we're talking about the look, Gary, um, the colors and the look, uh, Crockett, the character of Crockett, Don Johnson's character, he set kind of a fashion trend. Do you know how he did that? Was it because of the um, the blazer and the uh, yeah yeah the t shirt like yeah. the kind of cool casual yeah he and uh, the character Tubbs wore five to eight outfits every single episode. And really? They, they appeared in shades of pink and blue and green and peach and fuchsia uh, and the show's other approved colors. Oh. And that abundance of pastel colors on the show, Gary, uh, reflected Miami's Art Deco architecture. Yeah, so I can see that. These guys were kind of responsible for a resurgence of Art Deco in South Beach. I can see that. Yeah. So uh, I credit that to the uh, Miami Vice show. Uh, but Crockett also did something else. He uh, perpetually was unshaven. He had that 5 o'clock shadow. Yeah, and it so that inspired like men beard, to yeah. start wearing what was called a designer stubble. Designer stubble. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, listen, Then uh, every once in a while I like to support, uh, support my uh, designer, designer stubble. Designer stubble. I see it right now, as a matter of fact. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Interesting show, uh, not only iconic, but uh, interesting in, in so many different ways. Uh, the, the last thing uh, I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about the location because we have a special guest this evening. That we do. We have somebody who uh, started out his career with the help of Miami Vice. Yes, yes, yes. Barry Anderson, our friend and colleague, will be joining us very shortly. And he's going to give you uh, folks who are listening in a real treat, a behind the scenes look at the filming of Miami Vice. Because Barry, he was hired to be a background actor for the entire first season of the show. So every episode, he'd appear in the background as one of the um, undercover cops, uh, really grungy looking in the jeans and what have you. And and so uh, he, uh, he was there. Um, he was there in uh, each of the episodes. And so he has some stories to tell us. And so we're going to be calling on Barry very shortly. Let's go ahead and give him an intro by talking a little bit about the locations for the filming. Most of the episodes were filmed in the South Beach, as I mentioned earlier. And that's a section of Miami Beach, Gary. And uh, there's a street called Ocean Drive there, and the hotels were filled with uh, mostly uh, elderly Jewish retirees. Many of them were frail, and they were just subsisting on their Social Security payments. So guess what? These um, older folks that were there, frequently they ended up getting cast as extras in Miami Vice. Really? Yeah. Now, talk about actually being authentic. Can you imagine? I mean, these were the residents of South Beach in Miami Beach, so... Talk about authentic. Yeah. Uh, some of the actual residents there appearing as extras. Um, many of those beachfront hotels, Gary, they were run down at the time. And they've been renovated since the filming. And now they make South Beach one of South Florida's really popular places for both uh, tourists and celebrities. Now, the interior scenes, they were originally supposed to be filmed at Universal Studios in Los Angeles, but had that happened, our friend Barry Anderson never would have had a connection to Miami Vice. This is true. So fortunately, that did not happen. The decision was made to use the facilities at Greenwich Studios in North Miami instead, and the Greenwich Studios in North Miami, once upon a time, they were the Ivan Tours Studios, which was the home of Flipper and Doctari. Oh. And uh, Barry has some uh, interesting things to say about working in such an iconic, historic 
TV studio and film studio. So without further ado, let's bring Barry into our conversation, folks. Barry Anderson. How did you get involved with Miami Vice in the first place? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Miami Vice, never heard of it. It was a brand new thing. And I was trying to get my foot in the door of the business. And so, you know, my mother is the one that said, why don't you try out to get in uh, some uh, some parts for some movies or TV stuff or whatever. Uh, I'm like, well, uh, okay, how do you go about doing that? So I, I end up getting an agent and, uh, you know, I tried out for, I heard about the TV show Miami Vice, uh, was looking for people. So I sent a photograph of me looking like a tough guy, uh, sort of a 1950s rockabilly uh you know, guy had my hair kind of greased back with pompadour kind of thing. I was doing that anyways. I'm an art student, you know, I can <laughs> do crazy stuff. But, you know, I uh, sent a photograph down to uh, the casting directors with Dee Miller, and they called me up and said, uh, we like your look. Oh, could you come down and try out for the show? And I'm like, oh, yes, absolutely. And, and uh, they asked me to come in uh one morning, and I went down to uh, Ivan Torres Studios in North Miami, and they were doing some tryouts, and they talked to us and uh, gave us a few, you know, some information about what they were filming, and, uh, you know, this was an exciting opportunity. They had already filmed a pilot, so this was like, the pilot got picked up to be a television series, so suddenly this uh, little crazy thing that turned into something real that was happening. I thought maybe I would be cast as a bad guy for like one little scene or something, but they ended up casting me as an undercover police officer that was going to be running around in the police station and uh, wherever else they needed me. And they gave me a, a gun and a badge and uh, an I Miami vice ID with my photograph on it. You know, and I, I was like, this is uh, pretty wild here. And they said, well, you know, we need you to be here early in the mornings and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And I was excited. Like, and I went home and I said, oh, I got hired to be on this TV show. And they even feed you food there. <laughs> <laughs> I am an art student. This was, you know, so getting fed good food was, uh, you know, something exciting for me. Oh, yeah. I had no idea what I was getting myself into uh, at all. And I, nobody, I think, really had any understanding of what was about to happen with this brand new TV show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I guess the rest is kind of history with that. But you, uh, you start to realize that you've got a hit on your hands when the, there's a buzz that's happening around set, you know, and, uh, in the very beginnings, you know, I started to see some familiar faces from people, Gregory Sierra, the guy from uh, Barney Miller was there and, uh, he was only there for a few episodes and then he got replaced with Edward James Alamo. And, um, you know, I got to, uh, you know, meet these people and actually chatted with them. They, they all treated me, uh, just like uh, an equal to every to them, and uh, got to sit and eat meals with all of these people, and it was incredible to see what everybody's job was and how they did it. Uh, I really got to, of course, there's a lot of sitting there waiting for things to happen on set and repeat, repetitively uh, taking, you know, another take. Uh, get to go. My job would walk past with a box of files or be on the phone in the background at a desk or. Uh, writing something on a chalkboard or whatever it was, or cutting through the room while Crockett and Tubbs were standing in front of me, uh, you know, in camera. A lot of big scenes uh, come later on. Well, I'm, I know I'm right there standing there, but the, the I'm right off camera. <laughs> You're like, but I was in that room yeah. with all of that, but uh, the camera <laughs> was like right over my shoulder or something. But, you know, that's the way it works. And, uh, you know, I was just an extra in there, but uh, it was an incredible experience. Did you ever get a chance to uh, actually act on location in the streets, or was it strictly in the Ivan Torres studio? No, I did get out there um, on some of the scenes uh, where there were some shootout 
lots of things going on. And, and actually, I thought that I was going to be getting a uh, upgraded to some speaking lines. But unfortunately, that you know, in this industry, you be prepared for disappointments that happen. You know, just fate wasn't going to happen uh, for me on that end of it. Um, but there were some uh, shootouts. I think we were out in front of the. Uh, there was one scene I think they were filming in front of the Miami Herald area or, or you know, building somewhere. Uh, but uh, while we were all out there with our guns and everything, and it decided to rain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and, no. Oh, there goes that big scene, you know. There, there's so much for Barry Anderson's acting career here. <laughs> and then another time uh, I th- I had some speaking lines with, with tubs, uh, Philip Michael Thomas. And, uh, this was a huge, uh, scene where there were SWAT teams and uh, all kinds of gunfire and pyro stuff going on. And it, the night became quite long, uh, while we were down in, uh, Miami beach area. And, uh, we were told, uh, you know, just stay within these parameters here. You don't want to be wandering off, uh, here in the middle of the night in Miami beach back in those days. Uh, was it was not what it turns out to be now. Miami Vice helped to create Miami Beach uh, because it was kind of a ghost town almost back in the day. Very sleepy uh, area with a lot of rundown old um, uh, hotels and stuff back in the time. Uh, but uh, Miami Vice added all that wonderful color, that uh, aqua color in pink and, uh, you know, uh, all the fancy stuff. And people around the world wanted to come to Miami uh, <laughs> Beach to see all the uh, see Crockett and Tubs out there. Sure. But, yeah, unfortunately, you know, the sun started coming up after this long shoot uh, that I waited and waited and had practiced my lines for for days and uh, ended up going, we're out of time and we're just going to change the script uh, oh, at that point, you oh, know, man. so you just go, Oh man, I wish I wouldn't have told my friends about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. But it is, you know, again, it, Hey, I, I, and I'm not kidding. I was happy. The catering was great. And, uh, I was, uh, happy. I was getting paid. Uh, now I just got out of school. So I had just literally, uh, this was 1984, so, uh, you know, I had just gotten out of school. I had been eating, uh, you know, uh, who knows, uh, SpaghettiOs and uh, grilled cheese sandwiches, <laughs> and suddenly I got this uh, catering service that's feeding me uh, nice food. I'm uh, having meals with the lovely uh, ladies uh, from the show and uh, all, the, uh, all the talented stars there. I mean, just treat me like I'm just one of them, you know, and I'm just some kid going, wow, this is wild, you know, but had no idea what was really happening out there because I couldn't, I wasn't watching the show, but I was hearing on set this buzz starting to see more and more people coming and, uh, you know, wanting to see what's going on in press and stuff. And, you know, you realize that this show is a huge hit and, uh, it just got bigger and bigger and, uh, you know, became one of the iconic television series from the 1980s. Oh, uh, yeah, without a doubt. Day, mm-hmm. It has a huge, huge fan base and following. And, uh, you know, I'm just so blessed that I was there from the beginning to see it happen, you know, and to have shared time with these people and watched all this go on, uh, and, uh, you know, here we are sitting in Ivan Torres studios, uh, uh, eating my catered food, uh, sitting next to all these stars and talking to Philip Michael Thomas about, uh, all kinds of interesting subjects and, uh, got to know him a little bit, uh, and, and kept in touch after the show, uh, was over even, and you know, it, it was an amazing, amazing ride. Oh, absolutely. Now, wasn't there a, uh, a young actor uh, who uh, went on to become uh, a little bit more than famous uh, that you got to speak with? Oh, let's see. Um, well, gosh. Uh, oh, first name Johnny. <laughs> are you talking about? Are you talking about uh, I, the Ivan Torres or Miami Vice? Oh, um, my! I, I think it was Miami Vice. Uh, yeah, first yeah, name Johnny. Johnny. Oh my goodness! Well. You know, back in those days, I hung out with a lot of uh, people and uh, knew a lot of 
bands. I, I did artwork. I, I had my own silk screening uh, equipment. So I, I silk screened T-shirts to make a little extra money. And uh, so a lot of the bands that were local in that area, um, I made T-shirts for. And oh, okay. uh, so I got to know a lot of people. And Johnny Depp was in a band called The Kids. And oh. so we just hung out in the same circles and stuff. And, you know, he had a birthday. I could, he had a birthday party, and I was invited to his birthday. Uh, and uh, we had a chat. And he, I was working on Miami Vice, and he had just come back from working on Nightmare on Elm Street. And, um, so we were talking and he was really interested in the Miami Vice thing, you know, and, uh, you know, I said, me and a couple other people that knew him went to go see this Nightmare on Elm Street movie. And, uh, you know, of course, I don't know if I even saw it before uh, the, that conversation. I don't know. I think we may have had that gone to see it afterwards, but he, um, he said, well, uh, I'm going to be heading out to uh, California and try out for, uh, show uh uh jump uh, 21 jump street yeah, 21 and i'm jump like street. well good luck to you man uh well, you know that's exciting i was like i'm not sure what i'm gonna do but uh you know i'm uh maybe i'll be going back to miami vice or whatever but you know it was, that was the last time i saw him of course the rest is history with that he uh became a mega star and he truly was an he is an incredibly talented guy um, and uh, when we went to see Nightmare on Elm Street, we were kind of in shock at this crazy <laughs> movie. I was like, wow, this is wild. But, you know, yeah. I feel like uh, he wanted to be on Miami Vice. He would have done a much better job than I did, I'm sure. But, you know, it was, uh, you know, meanwhile, I went in my direction. He went in his. And uh, who knew? He ended up becoming a multi-trillionaire. I don't know. This guy owns his own islands. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am, the little old Barry Anderson. <laughs> now, but it, what, what a great experience though. And, uh, you know, uh, with, with being able to have that, uh, moment with Miami vice and, and where that kind of led you with all of that. Yeah. You know what? I really was interested in what everybody else was doing for their jobs. You know, the pyro guys, they were rigging up one of the cars to, uh, you know, get bullet hits, uh, all throughout the car. And I watched them wiring that all up and, uh, it was fascinated with the pyro stuff and it just, everybody, the gaffers, the, you know, just seeing what everybody did. I get to observe the whole process of television, uh, making. And, you know, that really was an incredible education to get, um, because it prepared me for a career in film production and television and uh, kind of understand what everybody's place is and what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, it, was, it really was an incredible opportunity, no doubt about it. A um, uh, lifetime of memories for that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, we have to thank you again, Barry, for, for coming back on and, and sharing some of your experiences with uh, being a part of that studio and, and also being a part of Miami Vice, which, I mean, like you said, it, it really was the show of the 80s. Iconic. And uh, I have a feeling, Gary, Barry is going to return. Oh, yes. Well, we love having Barry on our show. Yes, so. Uh, yes. Maybe, Sounds maybe. like a horror movie. Barry's return. <laughs> Barry's return. The return of Barry. I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I think next time we have you back on Barry, it might be for a Halloween special. Yeah, so, like, uh, you know, Grandma you know, was... I love that time of year, and I am always uh, up for some good Halloween fun. Absolutely, so that would be wonderful. Again, thank you, uh, Barry, and uh, until next time. I'm Richard. And I'm Gary, and this was an incredible story. Yes, it was. <laughs>